Book two, chapter four, part one of Love Among the Artists by George Bernard Shaw. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter four, part one early in the afternoon of the following day which was sunday charlie sutherland presented himself at church street kensington and asked mrs simpson who opened the door if mr jack was within no sir said mrs simpson gravely he is not in just at present on being pressed as to when he would be in mrs simpson became vague and evasive although she expressed sympathy for the evident disappointment of the visitor at last he said he would probably call again and turn disconsolately away he had not gone far when hearing a shout he looked back and saw jack uncombed unshaven in broken slippers and a stained and tattered coat running after him bareheaded come up come back cried jack his brazen tone somewhat forced by loss of breath it's all a mistake that jade come along he seized charlie by the arm and began to drag him back to the house as he spoke the boys of the neighbourhood soon assembled to look with awe at the capture of charlie only a few of the older and less reverent venturing to ridicule the scene by a derisive cheer jack marched his visitor upstairs to a large room which occupied nearly the whole of the first floor a grand pianoforte in the centre was covered with writing materials music in print and manuscript old newspapers and unwashed coffee cups the surrounding carpet was in such a state as to make it appear that periodically when the litter became too cumbrous it was swept away and permitted to lie on the floor just as it chanced to fall the chairs the cushions of which seemed to have been much used as pen wipers were occupied some with heaps of clothes others with books turned inside out to mark the place at which the reader had put them down one with a boot the fellow of which lay in the fender and one with a grimy kettle which had been recently lifted from the fire which in spite of the season burnt in the grate black brown and yellow stains of ink coffee and yolk of egg were on everything in the place sit down said jack impetuously thrusting his former pupil into the one empty chair a comfortable one with elbows shiny with constant use he then sought a seat for himself and in so doing became aware of the presence of mrs simpson who had come in during his absence with the hopeless project of making the room ready for the visitor here he said get some more coffee and some buttered rolls where have you taken all the chairs to i told you not to touch anything in this why what the devil do you mean by putting the kettle down on a chair not likely mr jack said the landlady that i would do such a thing oh dear in one of my yellow chairs too it's too bad you must have done it there was nobody else in the room be off and get the coffee i did not do it said mrs simpson raising her voice and well you know it and i would be thankful to you to make up your mind whether you are to be in or out when people call and not be making a liar of me as you did before this gentleman you are a liar ready-made and a slattern to boot retorted jack look at the state of this room ah said mrs simpson with a sniff look at it indeed i ask your pardon sir she added turning to charlie but what would anybody think of me if they was told that this was my drawing-room jack his attention thus recalled to his guest checked himself on the verge of a fresh outburst and pointed to the door mrs simpson looked at him scornfully but went out without further ado jack then seized a chair by the back shook its contents on to the floor and sat down near charlie i should not have spoken as i did just now he said with compunction let me give you a word of advice charles never live in the house with an untidy woman it must be an awful nuisance mr jack it is sure to lead to bad habits in yourself how is your sister and your father mary is just the same as ever and so is the governor i was with him in birmingham last autumn we heard the prometheus by jove mr jack that is something to listen to 
the saint matthew passion the ninth symphony and the nibelung's ring are the only works that are fit to be put behind it the overture alone is something screeching you like it that's right that's right and what are you doing at present working hard eh the old story mr jack i have failed in everything just as i failed at the music though i stuck to that better than any of the rest whilst i had you to help me you began everything too young no matter there is plenty of time yet well well what's the news i am going to an at home at madge lancaster's the actress you know she made me promise i'd call on my way and mention casually where i was going she thought that you'd perhaps come with me at least i expect that was her game she asked me to come some sunday and i told her i would is this sunday yes mr jack i hope you won't think it cool of me helping her to collar you in this way jack made some inarticulate reply pulled his coat off and began to throw about the clothes which were heaped on the chairs presently he rang the bell furiously and after waiting about twenty seconds for a response went to the door and shouted for mrs simpson in a stunning voice this had no more effect than the bell and he returned muttering execrations to resume his search when he had added considerable to the disorder of the room mrs simpson entered with ostentatious unconcern carrying a tray with coffee and rolls where would you wish me to put these things sir she said with a patient air after looking in vain for a vacant space on the pianoforte what things what do you mean by bringing them who asked you for them you did mr jack perhaps you would like to deny it to this gentleman's face who heard you give the order oh said jack discomfited charles will you take some coffee whilst i am dressing put the tray on the floor if you can't find room for it elsewhere mrs simpson immediately placed it at charlie's feet now said jack looking malignantly at her be so good as to find my coat for me and in future when i leave it in a particular place don't take it away from there yes sir and where did you leave it last if i may make bold to ask i left it on that chair said jack violently do you see on that chair indeed said mrs simpson with open scorn you gave it out to me yesterday to brush and a nice job i have had with it it took a whole bottle of benzine to fetch out the stains it's upstairs in your room and i beg you will be more careful with it in future or else send it to the dyers to be cleaned instead of to me shall i bring it to you no go to the go to the kitchen and hold your tongue charlie i shall be back presently my boy if you will wait and take some coffee put the tray anywhere confound that 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 woman he left the room then and after some time reappeared in a clean shirt and a comparatively respectable black frock coat where does she live he said in the marylebone road her at-homes are great fun her sisters don't consider it proper for a young unmarried woman to give at-homes on her own hook and so they never go i believe they would cut her altogether only they can't afford to because she gives them a new dress occasionally it will be a regular swagger for me to go in with you next to being a celebrity oneself the best thing is to know a celebrity jack only grunted and allowed charlie to talk until they arrived at the house in the marylebone road the door was opened by a girl in a neat dress of dark green with a miniature mob cap on her head i feel half inclined to ask her for a program and tip her sixpence whispered charlie as they followed her upstairs we may consider that she is conducting us to our stalls mr jack and mr charles sutherland he added aloud to the girl as they reached the landing mr sutherland and mr charles sutherland she answered coldly correcting him jack meanwhile had advanced to where madge stood she wore a dress of pale blue velvet made in venetian style imitated from an old paul veronese round her neck was a threefold string of amber beads and she was shod with slippers of the same hue and material as her dress her complexion skilfully put on did not disgust charlie but rather inspired him with a gentle regret that it was too good to be genuine the arrangement of the rooms was as remarkable as the costume of the hostess 
the folding doors had been removed and the partition built into an arch with a white pillar at each side a curtain of silvery plush was gathered to one side of this arch the walls were painted a delicate sheeny grey and the carpet resembled a piece of thick whitey brown paper the chairs of unvarnished wood had rush seats or else cushions of dull straw colour or cinnamon in compliance with a freak of fashion which prevailed just then there were no less than eight lamps distributed about the apartments these lamps had monstrous stems of pottery ware gnarled and uncouth in design most of them represented masses of rock with strings of ivy leaves clinging to them the ceiling was of a light maize colour magdalen surprised by the announcement of mr sutherland was looking towards the door for him over the head of jack than whom she was nearly a head taller how'd you do he said startling her with his brassy voice my dear master she exclaimed in the pure distinct tone to which she owed much of her success on the stage so you have come to me at last ay i have come at last he said with a suspicious look i forgot all about you but i was put in mind of your invitation by charles where's charles charles was behind him waiting to be received i am deeply grateful to you said magdalen pressing his hand charles rather embarrassed than gratified replied inarticulately vouched for the health of his family and retreated into the crowd i had ceased to hope that we should ever meet again she said turning again to jack i have sent you box after box that you might see your old pupil in her best parts but when the nights came the boxes were empty always i intended to go i should have gone but somehow i forgot the time or lost the tickets or something my landlady mislays things of that sort or very likely she burns them poor mrs simpson how is she alive and mischievous and long-tongued as ever i must leave that place i can stand her no longer her slovenliness her stupidity and her disregard of truth are beyond belief dear dear i am very sorry to hear that mr jack magdalen turned her eyes upon him with an expression of earnest sympathy which had cost her much study to perfect jack who seldom recollected that the subject of mrs simpson's failings was not so serious to the rest of the world as to himself thought magdalen's concern by no means overstrained and was about to enlarge on his domestic discomfort when the servant announced mr brailsford jack slipped away and his old enemy advanced as sprucely dressed as ever but a little more uncertain in his movements magdalen kissed him with graceful respect as she would have kissed an actor engaged to impersonate her father for so many pounds a week when he passed on and mingled with the crowd like any other visitor she forgot him and looked round for jack but he in spite of his attempt to avoid mr brailsford had just come face to face with him in a remote corner whither chance had led them both jack at once asked him how he did how do you do said the old gentleman with nervous haste glad to i am sure here he found his eyeglass and was unable to distinguish jack's features sir said jack i am an ill-mannered man on occasion but perhaps you will overlook that and allow me to claim your acquaintance sir replied brailsford tremulously clasping his proffered hand i have always honoured and admired men of genius and protested against the infamous oppression to which the world subjects them you may count upon me always there was a time said jack with a glance at the maize-coloured ceiling when neither of us would have believed that we should come to make two in a crowd of fashionable celebrities sitting round her footstool she has made a proud position for herself certainly thanks as she always acknowledges above all things to your guidance hm, said jack doubtfully i taught her to make the best of such vowels as there are left in our spoken language but her furniture and her receptions are her own idea they are the most ridiculous absurdities in london whispered brailsford with sudden warmth to you sir i express my opinion without reserve i come here because my presence may give a certain tone a sanction you understand me jack nodded but i do not approve of such entertainments i am at a loss to comprehend how the actress can so far forget the lady 
this room is not respectable mr jack it is an outrage on taste and sensibility however it is not my choice it is here and de gustibus non est disputandum you will excuse my quoting my old school books i never did so sir in my youth when every fool's mouth was full of scraps of latin there is a bad side to this sort of thing said jack these fellows waste their time coming here and she wastes her money on extravagancies for them to talk about but after all there is a bad side to everything she might indulge herself with worse follies now that she is her own mistress we must all stand further off her affairs are not our business the old gentleman nodded several times in a melancholy manner there you have hit the truth sir he said in a low voice we must all stand further off i as well as others a very just observation this dialogue exceptionally long for a crowded afternoon reception in london was interrupted by magdalen coming to invite jack to play which he peremptorily refused to do remarking that if the company were in a humour to listen to music they had better go to church the rebuff created much disappointment for jack's appearances in society common as they had been during the season which preceded the first performance of prometheus had since been very rare stories of his eccentricity and inaccessible solitude had passed from mouth to mouth until they had become too stale to amuse or too exaggerated to be believed his refusal to play was considered so characteristic that some of the guests withdrew at once in order that they might be the first to narrate the circumstances in artistic circles which are more at home on sundays than those of the more purely fashionable class which has nothing particular to do on weekdays jack was about to go himself when the blue velvet sleeve touched his arm and magdalen whispered they will all go in a very few minutes now will you stay and let me have a moment with you alone it is so long since i have had a word of advice from you jack again looked suspiciously at her but as she looked very pretty he relented saying good-humouredly get rid of them quickly then i have no time to waste waiting for them she set herself to get rid of them as well as she could by pretending to mistake the purpose of men who came up to converse with her and surprising them with effusive farewells to certain guests with whom she did not stand on ceremony she confided her desire to clear the room and they immediately conveyed her wishes to their intimate friends besides setting an example to others by taking leave ostentatiously or declaring in loud whispers that it was shamefully late that dear madge must be tired to death and that they were full of remorse at having been induced by her delightful hospitality to stay so long in fifteen minutes the company was reduced to five or six persons who seemed to think now that the crowd was over that the time had come for enjoying themselves a few of them who knew each other relaxed their ceremonious bearing raised their voices and entered into a discussion on theatrical topics in which they evidently expected magdalen to join the rest wandered about the rooms and made the most of their opportunity of having a good look at the great actress and the great composer who was standing at a window with his hands clasped behind him frowning unapproachably mr brailsford also remained and he was the first to notice the air of exhaustion with which his daughter was mutely appealing to her superfluous guests my child he said are you fatigued i am worn out she replied in a whisper which reached to the furthest corner of the room how i long to be alone why did you not tell me so before said brailsford offended i shall not trouble you any longer magdalen good evening hush she said laying her arm caressingly on his and speaking this time in a real whisper i meant that for the others i want you to do something for me mr jack is waiting to go with you and i particularly want to speak to him alone about a pupil could you slip away without his seeing you do dear old daddy for i may never have another chance of catching him in a good humour magdalen knew that her father would be jealous of having to leave before jack unless she could contrive to make him do so of his own accord the stratagem succeeded 
mr brailsford left the room with precaution glancing apprehensively at the musician who still presented a stolid back view to the company the group of talkers warned by madge's penetrating whisper submissively followed him leaving only one young man who was anxious to go and did not know how to do it she relieved him by giving him her hand and expressing a hope that she should see him next sunday he promised earnestly and departed now said jack wheeling round the instant the door closed what can i do for you your few minutes have spun themselves out to twenty did they seem so very long she said seating herself upon an ottoman and throwing her dress into graceful folds yes said jack bluntly so they did to me won't you sit down jack pushed an oaken stool opposite to her with his foot and sat upon it much as in a scandinavian story a dwarf might have sat at the feet of a princess well mistress he said things have changed since i taught you eh some things have you have become great and so in my small way have i i have become what you call great she said but you have not changed people have found out your greatness that is all well said said jack approvingly they starved me long enough first damn them used i to swear at you when i was teaching you i think you used to just a little when i was very dull it is a bad habit a stupid one as all low habits are i rarely fall into it and so you stuck to your work and fought your way that was right are you as fond of the stage as ever it is my profession said madge with a disparaging shrug one's profession is only half of one's life acting in london where the same play runs for a whole season leaves one time to think of other things sundays at home and fine furniture for instance things that they vainly pretend to supply i have told you that my profession is only half my life the public half now that i have established that firmly i begin to find that the private and personal half the half which is concerned with home and and domestic ties must be well established too or else the life remains incomplete and the heart unsatisfied in plain english you have too much leisure which you can employ no better than in grumbling oh, perhaps so but am i much at fault when i entered upon my profession its difficulties so filled my mind with hopes and fears and its actual work so fully occupied my time that i forgot every other consideration and cut myself off from my family and friends with as little hesitation as a child might feel in exchanging an estate for a plaything now that the difficulties are overcome the hopes fulfilled or abandoned and the fears dispelled now that i find that my profession does not suffice to fill my life and that i have not only time but desire for other interests i find how thoughtless i was when i ran away from all the affection i had unwittingly gathered to myself as i grew why what have you lost you have your family still i am as completely estranged from them by my profession as if it had transported me to another world i doubt if they are any great loss to you the public are fond of you ain't they they pay me to please them if i disappeared they would forget me in a week why shouldn't they how long do you think they should wear mourning for you have you made no friends in your own way of life friends yes i suppose so you suppose so what is the matter then what more do you want magdalen raised her eyelids for an instant and looked at him then she said nothing and let the lids fall with the cadence of her voice end of chapter four part one recording by expatriate in bangor maine Book Two, Chapter Four, Part Two of Love Among the Artists by George Bernard Shaw. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Chapter Four, Part Two. Listen to me, said Jack after a pause, drawing his seat nearer to her and watching her keenly. You want to be romantic. You won't succeed. 
look at the way we cling to the stage to music and poetry and so forth why do you think we do that just because we long to be romantic and when we try it in real life facts and duties baffle us at every turn men who write plays for you to act cook up the facts and duties so as to heighten the romance and so we all say how wonderfully true to nature and feel that the theatre is the happiest sphere for us all heroes and heroines are to be depended on there is no more chance of their acting prosaically than there is of a picture in the royal academy having stains on its linen or blacks in its sky but in real life it is just the other way the incompatibility is not in the world but in ourselves your father is a romantic man and so am i but how much of our romance have we ever been able to put into practice more than you recollect perhaps said madge unmoved for constant preoccupation with her own person had made her a bad listener but more than i shall ever forget there has been one piece of romance in my life a very practical piece a perfect stranger once gave me at my mere request all the money he had in the world perhaps he fell in love with you at first sight or perhaps which is much the same thing he was a fool perhaps so it occurred at paddington station some years ago oh is that what you are thinking of well that is a good illustration of what i am saying did any romance come out of that in three weeks time you were grubbing away at elocution with me at so much a lesson i know that no romance came out of it for you so you think said jack complacently but romance comes out of everything for me where do you suppose i get the supplies for my music and what passion there is in that what fire what disregard of conventionality in the music you understand not in my everyday life your art then is enough for you said madge in a touching tone i like to hear you speak observed jack you do it very well yes my art is enough for me more than i have time and energy for occasionally however i will tell you a little romance about myself which may do you some good eh have you the patience to listen patience echoed madge in a low steady voice try whether you can tire me very well you shall hear you must know that when after a good many years of poverty and neglect i found myself a known man earning over a hundred a year i felt for a while as if my house was built and i had no more to do than to put it in repair from time to time much as you think you have mastered the art of acting and need only learn a new part occasionally to keep your place on the stage and so it came about that i owen jack began to languish in my solitude to pine for a partner and in short to suffer from all those symptoms which you so admirably described just now he gave this account of himself with a derision so uncouth that madge lost for the moment her studied calm and shrank back a little i was quite proud to think that i had the affections of a man as well as the inspiration of a musician and i selected the lady fell in love as hard as i could and made my proposals in due form i was luckier than i deserved to be her admiration of me was strictly impersonal and she nearly had a fit at the idea of marrying me she is now the wife of a city speculator and i have gone back to my old profession of musical student and quite renounced the dignity of past master of the art i sometimes shudder when i think that i was once within an ace of getting a wife and family and so your heart is dead no it is marriage that kills the heart and keeps it dead better starve the heart than overfeed it better still to feed it only on fine food like music besides i sometimes think i will marry mrs simpson when i grow a little older you are jesting you have been jesting all along it is not possible that a woman refused your love it is quite possible and has happened and here he rose and prepared to go i should do the same good service to a woman if one were so foolish as to persuade herself on the same grounds that she loved me you would not believe that she could love you on any deeper and truer grounds said madge rising slowly without taking her eyes off his face stuff wake up miss madge 
and realize what nonsense you are talking rub your eyes and look at me a kobold a cyclop as that fine woman mrs herbert once described me what sane person under forty would be likely to fall in love with me and what do i care about women over forty except perhaps mrs herbert or mrs simpson i like them young and beautiful like you madge as if unconsciously raised her hand half offering it to him he took it promptly and continued humorously and i love you and have always done so who could know such a lovely woman and fine genius as you without loving her but he added shaking her fingers warningly you must not love me my time for playing romeo was over before you ever saw me and juliet must not fall in love with friar lawrence even when he is a great composer not if he forbids her and she can help it said madge with solemn sadness letting her hand drop as he released it not on any account said jack come he added turning on her imperiously we are not a pair you and i i know how to respect myself do you learn to know yourself we two are artists as you are aware well there is an art that is inspired by nothing but a passion for shamming and that is yours so far there is an art which is inspired by a passion for beauty but only in men who can never associate beauty with a lie that is my art master that and you will be able to make true love at present you only know how to make scenes which is too common an accomplishment to interest me you see you have not quite finished your lessons yet good-bye adieu said madge like a statue he walked out in the most prosaic manner possible and she sank on the ottoman in an attitude of despair and finding herself at her ease in it and not understanding him in the least kept it up long after he by closing the door had as it were let fall the curtain for it was her habit to attitudinize herself when alone quite as often as to her people in whose minds the pleasure of attitudinizing is unalloyed by association with the labor of bread-winning jack meanwhile had let himself out of the house it had become dusk by this time and he walked away in a sombre mood from which he presently roused himself to shake his head at the house he had just left and to say aloud you are a bold-faced jade this remark which was followed by muttered imprecations was ill-received by a passing woman who applying it to herself only waited until he was at a safe distance before retorting with copious and shrill abuse which soon caused many persons to stop and stare after him but he hardly conscious of the tumult and not suspecting that it had anything to do with him walked on without raising his head and was presently lost to them in the deepening darkness all this time charlie who had been among the first to leave madge's rooms was wandering about kensington in the neighbourhood of herbert's lodging he felt restless and unsatisfied shrinking from the observation of the passers-by with the notion that they might suspect and ridicule the motive of his lurking there he turned into camden hill at last and went to his sister's mary usually had visitors on sunday evenings and some of them might help him to pass away the evening pleasantly in spite of hoskins prose perhaps even but here he shook off further speculation and knocked at the door any one upstairs he asked carelessly of the maid as he hung up his hat only one lady sir mrs herbert something within him seemed to make a spring at the name he glanced at himself in the mirror before going into the drawing-room where to his extreme disappointment he found mary conversing not with herbert's wife but with his mother she had but just arrived and was explaining to mary that she had returned the day before from a prolonged absence in scotland charlie never enjoyed his encounters with mrs herbert for she had known him as a boy and had not got out the habit of treating him as one so hearing that hoskin was in another room smoking he pleaded a desire for a cigar and went off to join him leaving the two ladies together you were saying said mary resuming the conversation which his entrance had interrupted i was saying said mrs herbert that i have never been able to sympathize with the interest which you take in adrian's life and opinions 
geraldine tells me that i have no maternal instinct but then geraldine has no sons and does not quite know what she is talking about i look on adrian as a failure and i really cannot take an interest in a man who is a failure his being my son only makes the fact disappointing to me personally i retain a kind of nursery affection for my boy but of what use is that to him since he has given up his practice of stabbing me through it i would go to him if he were ill and help him if he were in trouble but as to maintaining a constant concern on his account really i do not see why i should you with your own little dear one a fresh possession almost a part of yourself still doubtless think me very heartless but you will learn that children have their separate lives and interests as completely independent of their parents as the remotest strangers i do not think adrian would even like me were it not for his sense of duty you will understand some day that the common notion of parental and filial relations are more unpractical than even those of love and marriage mary who had already made some discoveries in this direction did not protest as she would have done in her maiden time what surprises me chiefly is that mrs herbert should have been rude to you she said i doubt whether she is particularly fond of me indeed i am sure she is not but nothing could be more exquisitely polite and kind than her manner to me especially in her own house i grant you the perfection of her manners dear she was not rude to me not that they are exactly the manners of good society but they are perfect of their kind for all that hush i think did i not hear adrian's voice that time adrian was in fact speaking in the hall to hoskin who had just appeared there with charlie on his way to the drawing-room aurelie was with her husband they all went for a moment into the study which served on sunday evenings as a cloak-room i assure you mrs herbert said hoskin officiously helping aurelie to take off her mantle i am exceedingly glad to see you ah yes said aurelie but this is quite wrong it is you who should render me a visit in this moment because i ask you to dine with me and you do not come you have turned up at a very good time said charlie mischievously mrs herbert is upstairs my mother said adrian in consternation shall we go upstairs said hoskin leading the way with resolute cheerfulness adrian looked at aurelie she had dropped the lively manner in which she had spoken to hoskin and was now moving towards the door with ominous grace and calm aurelie he said detaining her in the room for a moment my mother is here you will speak to her for my sake will you not she only raised her hand to signify that she was not to be troubled and then without heeding his look of pain and disappointment passed out and followed hoskin to the drawing-room where mary and mrs herbert having heard her foreign voice were waiting scarcely less disturbed than adrian by their fear of how she might act mrs herbert jr has actually condescended to pay you a visit mary said hoskin how do you do said mary with misgiving i am so very glad to see you so often have i to reproach myself not to have called on my friends said aurelie in her sweetest voice that i yielded to adrian at the risk of deranging you by coming on the sunday evening a pause followed during which she looked inquisitively around ah she exclaimed with an air of surprise and pleasure as she recognized mrs herbert is it possible you are again in london madame she advanced and offered her hand mrs herbert who had sat calmly looking at her made the greeting as brief as possible and turned her attention to adrian nevertheless aurelie drew a chair close to hers and sat down there you are looking very well mother said adrian when did you return only yesterday adrian there was a brief silence adrian looked anxiously at aurelie and his mother mutely declined to look at her but behold what is absurd said aurelie you madame who are encore so young so beautiful here mrs herbert who had turned to her with patient attention could not hide an expression of wonder you are already a grandmother adrian has what you call a son and heir it is true yes i am aware of that said mrs herbert coolly a slight change appeared for an instant in aurelie's face and she glanced for a moment gravely at her husband 
he with disgust only half concealed said you could not broach a subject less interesting to my mother and turned away to speak to mary adrian began mrs herbert who found herself unexpectedly disturbed by the implied imputation of want of feeling i do not think then as he was not attending to her she turned to aurelie and said you really must not accept everything that adrian says seriously pray tell me all about your boy my grandson i should say he is like you said aurelie trying to conceal the chill which had fallen upon her perhaps you would like to see him if so i shall bring him to you if you will permit me i shall be very glad said mrs herbert rather surprised let me say that i have been expecting you to call on me for some time you are very good said aurelie but think of how i live i am always voyaging and you also are seldom in london besides when one is an artist one neglects things forget i pray you my my ah i do not know how to say it but i will come to you with monsieur jean Sizimplica herbert that reminds me i know not your address mrs herbert supplied the desired information and the conversation then proceeded amicably with occasional help from hoskin and charlie mary and adrian had withdrawn to another part of the room and were already engrossed in a discussion in the course of it mary remarked that matters were evidently smooth between the two mrs herberts i am glad of it said adrian not looking glad i was disposed to think aurelie in fault on that point but i see plainly enough now how the coolness was brought about i should not have blamed aurelie at all if she had repaid my mother's insolence i do not think that at all too strong a word in kind poor aurelie i have been all this time secretly thinking hardly of her for having as i thought rebuffed my mother unjust and stupid that i am not to have known better from my lifelong experience of the one and my daily observation of the other aurelie has conciliated her to-night solely because i begged her to do so as we came upstairs you cannot deny that my wife can be perfectly kind and self-sacrificing whenever there is occasion for it i cannot deny it adrian you speak as though i were in the habit of disparaging her you are quite wrong no one can admire her more than i my only fear is that she is too sweet and may spoil you how could i resist her even your mother prejudiced as she certainly was against her has yielded you can see by her face that she has given up the battle i think we had better join them we have a very rude habit of getting into a corner by ourselves i am sure in spite of all you say that mrs herbert is too fond of you to like it mrs herbert is a strange being said adrian rising i no longer pretend to understand her likes and dislikes mary made a mental note that aurelie had probably had more to say on the subject of what she saw in the studio than adrian had expected the general conversation which ensued did not run on personal matters aurelie was allowed to lead it as it was tacitly understood that the interest of the occasion in some manner centred in her mrs herbert laughingly asked her for the secret of managing adrian but she adroitly passed on to some other question and would not discuss him or in any way treat him more familiarly than she did hoskin or charlie later on hoskin proposed that they should go downstairs to a room which communicated with the garden by a large window and a small grassy terrace as the night was sultry they readily agreed and were soon seated below at a light supper after which hoskin strolled out into the garden with adrian to smoke another cigar and to show a recently purchased hose and lawn-mower it being his habit to require his visitors to interest themselves in his latest acquisitions whether of children furniture or gardening implements mrs herbert who despite the glory of the moon could not overcome her belief that fresh air to be safely sat in should be tempered by a roof did not venture beyond the carpet and mary felt bound to remain in the room with her aurelie walked out to the edge of the terrace clasped her hands behind her and became wrapped in contemplation of the cloudless sky which was like a vast moonlit plain her attention was recalled by the voice of charlie beside her 
awfully jolly night isn't it mrs herbert yes it is very fine i suppose you find no end of poetry in all those stars poetry no i am not at all poetic monsieur charles i don't altogether believe that you know you look poetic it is therefore that people mistake me they are very arbitrary they say mademoiselle szymplica has such and such a face and figure in our minds such a face and figure associate with poetry therefore must she be poetic we will have it so and if she disappoint us we shall be very angry with her and i do disappoint them when they talk poetically of music and things i am impatient myself to be at home with maman who never talks of such things and the bambino who never talks at all what think you do i find in those stars i am looking for aurelie and thecla in what you call charles's wain aha i did not think of that before you are monsieur charles to whom belongs the wain yes i have put my hand to the plough and turned back often enough what may aurelie and thecla be aurelie is myself and thecla is my doll in my infancy i named a star after every one whom i liked only very particular persons were given a place in charles's wain it was the great chariot of honour and in the end i found no one worthy of it but my doll and myself behold how i am poetic i was a silly child for i forgot to give my mother a star i forgot all my family when my mother found that out one day she said i had no heart and indeed i fear i have none heaven forbid look you monsieur charles she said with a sudden air of shrewdness unclasping her hands to shake her finger at him i am not what you think me to be i am the very other things of it i have the sole commercial within me i am glad of that he said eagerly for i want to make a business proposal to you will you give me lessons give you lesson lesson of what lessons in playing i want awfully to become a good pianist and i have never had any really good teaching since i was a boy vraiment ah you think that as you persevered so well in the different professions you will find it easy to become a player is it not so not at all i know that playing requires years of perseverance but i think i can persevere if you will teach me monsieur charles you are what shall i call you you are an ingenuous infant i think don't make fun of me mrs herbert i'm perfectly in er here to his confusion his voice broke with emotion you think i am mocking you she said not seeming to notice the accident i am not fool enough to suppose that you care what i think he said bitterly losing his self-possession i know you won't give me the lessons i knew it before and wherefore then did you ask me because i love you he replied with symptoms of hysterical distress i love you ah said aurelie severely do you see my husband there looking at you and do you not know that it is very wicked to say such a thing to me remember monsieur charles you are quite sober now i shall not excuse you as i did before i couldn't help it said charlie half crestfallen half desperate i know it's hopeless i felt it the moment i had said it but i can't always act like a man of the world i wish i had never met you and why i like you very well when you are good but this is already twice that you forget to be an honest gentleman is it not dishonourable thus to envy your friend if monsieur herbert had a fine watch would you wish to possess it no the thought that it was his would impeach would hinder you to form such a wish well you must look upon me as a watch of his you must not even think such things as you have just said i will not be angry with you monsieur sutherland because you are very young and you have admirable qualities but you have done wrong before he could reply she moved away and joined her husband at the end of the garden charlie with his mouth hanging open stared at her for some seconds and then went into the supper-room where he incommoded mary and mrs herbert by lounging about occasionally taking a grape from the table or pouring out a glass of wine at last he strolled to the drawing-room where he was found with a book in his hand pretending to read 
by the others when they came upstairs some time after he did not speak again until he bade farewell to the elder mrs herbert who departed under hoskins escort aurelie before following her example went to the nursery with mary to have a peep at master richard hoskin as he lay in his cot he smiles said aurelie what a charming infant the bambino never smiles he is so triste like adrian as they turned to leave the room she added poor adrian i think of going to america this year but he does not know you will take care of him whilst i am away will you not mary seeing that she was serious was puzzled how to reply as far as i can i will certainly she said after some hesitation then laughing she continued it is rather an odd commission not at all not at all said aurelie still serious he has great esteem for you madam greater than for no matter what person in the world mary opened her lips to say except you but somehow she did not dare instead she remarked that perhaps adrian would accompany his wife to america the trip she suggested would do him good no no said aurelie quickly he does not breathe freely in the artist's room at a concert he is out of place there my mother will come with me do not speak of it to him yet i know not whether they will guarantee me a sufficient sum but even should i not go i shall still be much away as i have told you i leave england for six weeks on the first of next month you will not suffer adrian to mope and you will speak to him of his pictures about which i am so epouvantably stupid i will do my best said mary privately thinking that aurelie was truly an unaccountable person while she was speaking they re-entered the drawing-room now adrian i am ready yes said herbert good night mary i think i heard you say that mrs herbert is going off on a long tour said charlie coming forward and speaking boldly though his face was very red yes said adrian not a very long tour though thank goodness then i shall not see her again at least not for some time i have made up my mind to take that post in the connolly company's branch at leeds and i shall be off before mrs herbert returns from the continent this is a sudden resolution said mary in some astonishment i hope mrs herbert thinks it a wise one said charlie she has often made fun of my attempts at settling myself in the world yes said aurelie it is very wise and quite right your instinct tells you so good night and bon voyage monsieur charles my instinct tells me that it is very foolish and quite wrong he said taking her proffered hand timidly but i see nothing else for it under the circumstances i don't look forward to enjoying myself good-bye mary then went downstairs with her guests but he turned back into the room and watched their departure from the window End of Book 2, Chapter 4